Hi, I'm Ray Simmons, a great-grandson of Charles I.D. Luth, one of the leading carvers and builders of carousels in the United States. And this is my wife, Beverly, Beverly Simmons. Hello. This is an old family chest, and we have filled it with memorabilia about the history of the carousel and the work of Charles I. D. Louvre. This is a collage of some of the family members. Charles was born in, in uh, Schleswig-Holstein, which is a part of De Denmark, excuse me, Denmark, in 1852. And he immigrated to New York in, when he was only 18 years old. My grandmother told us stories about Charles Luce middle name. Evidently when he came to Brooklyn from Denmark where he was born in 1852 the immigration officials asked him for a middle name for ID purposes. Well he thought a minute and then he said well my initials are ID. So we don't know whether he had a real middle name or whether he was just uh, joshing them but it's a, fun, it's a fact that none of his six children ever had middle names. This is a photograph of Charles Loof when he was 28 years old and he married Anna Dolly in 1874. These are his children and grandchildren. Here's a picture of Charles I.D. Loof with his wife Anna Dolly. My great-grandmother is Helen, one of his uh, daughters, Helen Loof Simmons with her husband Charlie. Oh look, here's a picture of the first carousel at Coney Island which he built in 1876. This is him right here. After Mr. Loof um, immigrated from Denmark to New York, he settled in Brooklyn and worked as a furniture carver. And in the evenings uh, after work he would bring his carving tools home and using little bits of leftover wood, he carefully carved 27 wooden horses. And he slowly constructed a carousel, which consisted of three rows of nine horses each. And he was able to find a buyer for this uh, ride. It was a Mr. Vandermeer, and it was installed in, in Coney Island. And then buoyed by his success, he built a small factory and uh, constructed several other carousels in Coney Island. Anyway, that's the first of many carousels that he built for Coney Island and it was there that he developed his distinctive and famous Coney Island carving style for which he was known. And he also used himself as an example, as a model for some of the figures at around the, at the top of the rounding board. Yeah, well, look here. Here's a picture of of my great grandfather with uh, three of his pet bears, and down below is a picture of a string of horses or ponies that he owned and a whole herd of dogs. He loved animals and. Uh, used them to model his figures on the carousels from. So the the features on the horses, on the wooden horses, are very authentic. <clears throat> right Let's down. see, this is part of the rounding board on a loose carousel at Slater Park in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. And this carousel was a very primitive carousel all of the figures were stationary. So it was an earlier carousel than the ones at Crescent Park. The success that Mr. Louf had in Brooklyn um, encouraged him to move to 
Riverside, Rhode Island, where he opened a factory and built many carousels for the uh, the, uh, the amusement parks along the East Coast, up and around the Boston area and so forth. These two are at Crescent Park in Riverside, Rhode Island. This carousel was at the head of the pier, which stuck out into Biscayne Bay, and across the Narragansett Bay. Narragansett Bay. <laughs> <laughs> in uh, Rhode Island and across the midway was this other carousel which was his showpiece and he would have buyers come in from around the country and look at the horses on this showpiece and pick out the ones that they wanted and he would re recreate them for for them the shop was in behind and attached to the carousel on the main floor on the first floor was the um, the wood shop where they carved the horses. Below that was the foundry where they did the mechanical and iron work, making gears, making shafts, and uh, that sort of thing, building the platforms. Well, here's a picture of a buffalo or a bison that Charles Luth carved for one of his rides. And I noticed that this one says that this horse was found in Bogota, Colombia in 1986. And uh, these are various horses and animals. Here's a, a greyhound dog that he carved for one of his machines. And this is one of his little goats that ended up in Old Town, Kissimmee, Florida. Charles Loof was helped by his sons. Uh, Arthur Loof was kind of the, the main um, person to direct the, the factories and do most of the, uh, the work. Um, he also had Charles Jr. who did most of the coaches and uh, a lot of the structural work. Here are a few of my great-grandfather's tools that he used to carve and uh, construct the carousels. This is an ancient plane that he used. The uh, handle has been broken, but you can see the uh, blade sticking down here and uh, this would be the way that the blade was adjusted to get the proper cut. He used basswood a lot on his, car on his carousel horses and this is one of the tools that he would use to carve that basswood. This is a screw that would hold, as part of a, a clamp, that would hold the laminated pieces of wood together as they dried. They would glue them in, in, in individual sections and then they would put this clamp on there let it set up until the glue dried and then they would start their carving. Here, here is a uh, I assume it's a screwdriver of some sort that he probably made and um, a lot of these tools they made themselves and used in the construction of the rides. Bev, did you want to? Yeah, this is um one of the little plaques that would be used for decorations on the rounding boards. And quite a nice little example of a piece that was carved out of one separate piece of wood. And they used a lot of gold leaf on their decorations. They might paint that white and then the, the, uh, the smaller curvy parts would be applied with gold leaf which would shine under the lights and really look beautiful. Here's a couple of other exa small examples of some of his carvings uh, that would be applied on various parts of the structure to uh, give it some character. This is an example of one of Charles Loof's carvings. As you can see, it's an unfinished carving. It's still in the natural wood. The shoulder area, the horn area of this dragon are are either missing or they're uncarved. They're still in the block form. You can see the laminations of the basswood that he would put together to make a larger piece. This type of carving would go on the front of a chariot, which was a seat that was on the carousel, either a two-seater or a one-seater coach. And there were usually two dragons that were fighting, and they were intertwined and biting each other and that they would, uh, the head of the dragon would be out in front of the, of the coach and the bodies of the dragons would be along the side of the coach. 
I, I assume it's made out of basswood. That was his most popular wood that he used. There were two or three other kinds of woods that they also used, uh, but I think the bass, which is I think the American linden tree, uh, is is the it's lightweight. It uh, does not have a grain, a uh, distinct grain, so that it can be carved at different angles. A real grainy wood would split along the grain, and you wouldn't be able to get these intricate curves. Go round, the merry go round, the merry go round. Come, let's see the merry go round, go round and around and around. This figure was on a band organ. These band organs were used on the carousels at the turn of the century. And she was from Crescent Park in Riverside, Rhode Island. When my grandmother, Helen Loof Simmons, was a young girl, the family lived in Staten Island, New York. And they owned a carousel in Rhode Island. So every Saturday morning, my grandmother would get on the ferry and travel around um, the uh, point of, of Long Island and go up into Biscayne Bay on the ferry. Probably took her four hours or more. She would open up the carousel, run it all day long and all night long, and sleep there in, in the back room, open it up again Sunday, operate the, game, the ride all day long, all night long, close it up and then get back and take the last ferry home back to Staten Island. And she did this uh, for quite a few years. I thought that was quite a feat for a, a young woman back in those days. This was probably at the turn of the century, around 1896 or 7 or 8. Louf, who was ever the visionary, looked west and saw opportunity in California. So in 1903, he moved his manufacturing operation to Long Beach. It was here that he built carousels that operated all along the West Coast, from Santa Cruz to Venice Beach, Redondo Beach, San Diego, Long Beach, San Francisco, and on up the coast into Seattle and Spokane. One of the fine carousels that um, Charles Loof built was the one that he installed, the four-row machine that he installed at Salt Air Park, Utah in 1910. During this time, he built uh, Ferris wheels and a roller coaster. I believe the roller coaster at Whitney's Playground in San Francisco was one of the, was one of the ones that he built. In 1916, Loof built the Loof's Amusement Pier at Santa Monica, California. And the family lived in the apartment over the carousel for many years. In 1918, Charles I.D. Loof died, leaving a wonderful heritage that shows in the happy smiles of generations of children. The magnificent Crescent Park Carousel, on which I grew up, is still in operation at its original location in Riverside. My first job was as a ring boy on this carousel. I had a, a, a wire with a, a, um, a loop in one end and a, a bend and a sharp point on the other end. And as the people would drop the rings that they were trying to catch from the, from the ring arm, they would drop on the floor. I would go around and pick them up with this with, with this um, wire device. You had a little wrist action there to, to flip the ring over onto, onto the point. And then when you got a whole bunch of them on the, on the wire, you would dump them up into the ring box, which was a platform which had a ring boy on it, and he would feed the rings into the arm. And then midway through the ride, he had one that was a gold ring, is actually a brass ring, but they called it the gold ring. And he would slip it into the arm, and the person that got the gold ring would get a free ride. When I was a kid in Riverside, and school was out for the summer, 
the most exciting part of the day was after dinner when we jump in the car and drive down Bullocks Point Avenue and I would head for the carousel. It's the only ride I wanted to ride. I had a favorite horse and I would wait to get on him and when that ride started going the next best thing was to get the gold ring. And you'd go round and round and round and then as quick as a flash shoo, get that <laughs> ring. <laughs> if you didn't get the gold ring you threw the ring in the clown's mouth and you tried again on the next go round. The ride opened at one o'clock in the afternoon and until eleven o'clock at night except on, on the weekends it was open till one in the morning and this band organ was loud and it was right at the front of the midway and you could hear it throughout the entire park so I spent most of my entire life listening to these um, exotic uh, marching sound songs and, and um, the typical band organ music and I can still hear it now when I sleep it's, uh, it's just it's beautiful and it uh, brings back so many memories but... brings back memories of a first kiss on the carousel <laughs> I never had a first kiss on the carousel. <laughs> Let's hear more about this story. This type of amusement ride is so important to the community. It, it brings people together. It makes adults feel like children. And it brings untold joy to the children of the community.